Hi guys, <clears throat> it is me to continue physiology. So far I've seen so many lessons. Now this is another chapter in physiology that is locomotion movement. So particularly speaking, concerned with the muscular system and the skeletal system. What are the different types of muscles and what are the different types of bones responsible for the movement of the body. Normally we can say all movements are not locomotions. All movements are not locomotions. So normally all locomotions are movements, but not all movements are locomotions. Suppose you are lifting your hand. It is not a locomotion. It is only the movement. That's why we can say all locomotions are movements, but not all movements are locomotions. <clears throat> what is the meaning of locomotion? So any voluntary movement, which brings about a change in location or what we have a place, then it's called what is known as locomotion. That's given here too. Voluntary movements that result in a change of a place or location are called locomotion. <clears throat> what I mentioned earlier, all locomotions are movements, but all movements are not locomotions. Here is an example. In palmation, we now see the help in the movement of foot through sight of fans. It is not a locomotion, but the sila is also helping the movement of the body, then it's called locomotion. Similarly, hydra, a multicellular animal. It can use tentacles for capturing the prey by moving the tentacles. It is not a locomotion. But at the same time, that tentacle being used for the movement of the animal, that is called locomotion. That's why I say, all locomotions are movements. <coughs> But not all movements, but not actually all movements are locomotions. Now we'll have normally in the animal kingdom, we have three different types of movements. That is with reference to our body I'm talking about, not other animals. Either any animal including me or including any human being. So inside the body, we have different types of cells. The cells exhibit different types of movement. So. Three main types of movements, not locomotions. I am saying that only the movements, amoeboid movement. You see that one, the WBCs. Say an example of the macrophages, the wandering phagocytes, or the leukocytes, generally speaking. They are exhibiting amoeboid movement. Irregular shaped cells they exhibit amoeboid movement. And the, another type of movement, now certain tubules in a body are lined with ciliated squamous epithelium. That is responsible for driving the materials towards one direction. So the ciliary movement is exhibited by some cells, what is called the ciliated epithelium, which help in the movement of certain structures through the tubules. So most of the tubular internal organs, which are lined by ciliated epithelium, that shows what is called the ciliary movement, the oscillation of the cilia. Now, for example, the coordinated movements of the cilia in the case of trachea which help in removing dust particles as well as driving out any foreign substances, including what we have the phloem also. And likewise, in the fallopian tube, the passage of O through the female reproductive tract, what is called the fallopian tube, it is also lined with the ciliated squamous epithelium, which drives the egg, that is, after fertilization, towards the uterus. It is a kind of ciliary movement. So, amoeboid movement exhibited by mainly that is uh, the leukocytes and the ciliary movement is exhibited by the cells particularly the squamous epithelium ciliated squamous epithelium lining the trachea and also lining the fallopian tube or the female reproductive tract now the muscular movement there is a third type of movement that movement is helping not only movement of various parts of the body but also helping in locomotion so, movement of the lips, jaws, tongue, etc. These are all the movements. At the same time, we have, that is, locomotion. The locomotion is normally brought about by the coordinated movement of coordinated functions of the skeletal system, the muscular system, and also the nervous system. These are all the three systems responsible for the coordination of the various types of what we have the locomotions. Three systems. The skeleton formed of bones, the muscular system formed of the muscles, and the 
coordination of these two is brought about by the neural system, the nervous system, including the brain and spinal cord along with the nerves. Now the muscular system. What are the properties of muscles? There are four major properties. So the muscles have the property of contractility, extensibility. Contractility just actually reducing the length. Exit, ex, exit, sorry, extensibility that is extending its length. Excitability it can be excited, stimulate, and finally elasticity. So, excitability, elasticity, extensibility, and also contractility these are the four major properties. Because of these properties only, we have the ability of moving from one place to another place, doing some movements with the help of various organs of the body, etc. So, normally, if you are taking the muscles, the muscles are the property of the way contraction and relaxation, but never expand. This is one of the properties. The muscles contract, relax, but never expand. Now, again, the major element found in the muscles is potassium. The major element in the muscle is potassium. And the next one we have the sodium muscle, but major element found in the muscle is potassium. While burning the muscles, the one which is left is nothing but what we have the powdered ash. That is nothing but you have that is potassium along with some amount of sodium too. Now if you are taking the total weight of the body, nearly 40 to 45 percent of the body weight of human adult is contributed by the muscles. When compared to other parts of the body, this one consists much more, 40 to 45 percent of the total weight of the body is formed with the muscles. Normally, the muscle tissue is also called contracted tissue because of their ability to contract, their ability to contract. Now, embryologically, the muscles are derived from mesoderm, they are mesodermal derived. But one of the muscles, there is an exception, the ectodermal muscle, what we call the iris muscles. The muscles of the iris and eyes, ectodermal derivative. This is an exception. Ectodermal derivative. All muscles have been derived from the mesoderm, excepting what we have, that is the iris. Muscles in iris. Remember this one. What are the types of muscles? So, based on the location, based on what we have the nature of look, what we have the regulation, how far they regulated. So location may be found attached to the muscles, may be found in the heart or may be found, you see that one in the smooth the walls of the blood vessels, digestive tract, etc. This is called the location. Then we have the nature of regulation, whether they are working under the brain control, that is then we can say voluntary or they are working just involuntarily, not under the control of brain. And also based on the nature of appearance. Some muscles have striped appearance, having some bands or plus striped appearance, and some others without any stripes. So striations are present or absent. So anyway, based on the location, based on the appearance, and also the nature of regulation, whether under the control of brain or not under the control of brain, accordingly we can say involuntary and voluntary muscles. So, and based on this one, we have three different types of muscles. One, see that one skeletal muscle. This is based on the location. These are the muscles attached to the bones. Then, then appearance. They have some stripes. Striations are present, hence called striped muscles. And based on the nature of regulation, they are under our control or under the bright control. Hence called voluntary muscles. Then, the second one, visceral muscles, this is based on the location. Where is it located? It is located normally in the visceral organs like intestine, the digestive tract. Then we have the circulatory blood vessels, urinary bladder, etc. These are all the visceral organs. Then they do not have any striations, hence called smooth muscles, smooth muscles, or non striated muscles. And they are not working under our control, they are working independently may be regulated by the autonomous nervous system, hence called involuntary muscles. For example, the heart is also involuntary muscle. Now, the contraction relaxation of the blood vessels according to the conditions, prevalence in the body, 
and that is why it's called involuntary muscles it is not under the control of the brain <coughs> not waiting for the brain for the command just like that also now the third one based on the location the cardiac muscle found in the heart the cardiac muscles found in the heart hence the name cardiac it is having feeble striations just like what we have the skeletal muscles are the striated muscles but the striations are not much thick feeble striations and these muscles are also according to the nature of regulation not under the control of brain they are working independently hence called involuntary muscles so both the cardiac and visceral muscles are involuntary muscles based on the nature of regulation now let's take the structural aspects of skeletal muscles as the name implies they are found attached to the bones for example the biceps muscles the triceps muscles or the quadriceps muscles the hamstring muscles so so th these are all some of the muscles so many muscles we have in the body and we have certain muscles that peculiar structures only here now they occur as bundles of muscle cells the muscle cells are otherwise called myocytes as they are elongated fiber like the name is given muscle fibers you see muscle cells otherwise called muscle fibers or myocytes and the name also given sarcocytes the word sarco means flesh so muscle cells the muscle fibers because they are elongated myocytes once again the technical word used for the muscle cells or we can say sarcocytes now the entire skeletal muscle is normally enclosed by a sheath of what is called fibrous connective tissue the entire muscle for example if you are taking the biceps entire muscle being surrounded by actually covered with a fibrous connective tissue that is called epimyce now if you are taking one muscle each muscle is made up of many muscle cells the muscle cells are formed in bundles each bundle of muscle fibers is called fascicular so each muscle if you are taking the biceps it is being formed of many muscle bundles each muscle bundle is made up of many muscle fibers and each bundle is called fasciculus i'll show the picture later on fasciculus now all the fasciculus the muscle bundles are held together by means of a common collagenous tissue and this tissue layer is called fascia this tissue layer is called fascia see that one so this is epimyosin this is one muscle i'll take another picture too now this is a better picture you see that one now the entire muscle is surrounded by you see that one epimyosin this is epimyosin and each one is a muscle bundle this is a muscle bundle and each spot is what we have is just normally a muscle fiber now the entire muscle is surrounded by a fibrous connective tissue called as epimyosin and which is being made up of that is actually each muscle is being made up of many muscle bundles each muscle bundle is called fascicle which consists of a number of muscle fibers fascicle and each muscle bundle or fascicle is surrounded by a layer of connective tissue that is called perimyosin this is the one this is the perimyosin this is one muscle bundle this is the perimyosin and individual muscle fiber you see that one again the individual muscle fibers are surrounded by another membrane structure what is called endomyosin so epimyosin the entire muscle being surrounded by fibrous connective tissue then each muscle bundle is surrounded by what is called perimyosin an individual muscle fiber is separated from other muscle fiber or muscle cell by means of what is called endomyosin so all these fibrous connective tissues are actually terminate to form what is called a tendon they are all drawn together to form a single structure what is called the tendon a tendon is nothing but you know that one a dense fibrous connective tissue i talked about in the histology part so a dense fibrous connective tissue this is the question also a tendon connects a muscle with a bone a tendon connects a muscle with a bone it is normally formed by all the three layers combined together to form fibrous tendon and similarly you see that what is a ligament a ligament connects two bones so tendon connects a muscle with a bone a ligament connects a bone with another so two bones are connected with the ligament 
A muscle with the bone is connected by what is called as a tendon. This is what we have actually this is the arrangement. Now we have to go for once again the state. All the sheets around the fascicle are collected called perimyxia. What I mentioned. The sheets around the individual muscle cells. This is individual muscle fibers we can see. This is the anti fascicle or fasciculus perimyxia. And this one individual muscle fibers and so I mentioned all the actions of all these fibrous sheets beyond the ends of the muscle together constitute the tendon which connects the muscle with the bones. Now we have what about the tongue muscle, whether it is a skeletal muscle or visceral muscle or that is a cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle exclusively only in that is what we have the heart one. So the muscles of the tongue which are not attached to the bones. But it's not considered as a visceral muscle. But such muscle, namely the tongue muscle, is called intrinsic muscle. Neither skeletal nor visceral name is given to this one. Simply they are called as intrinsic muscles. Intrinsic muscles, the tongue muscles. Now this is another picture showing what we call the entire muscle. This is the entire muscle. We have epimycin, the outermost covering. Then this one is what we have muscle bundle surrounded by perimysium or fascicle. Actually the muscle bundle is called fascicle. Even also muscle bundle surrounded by perimysium. And each muscle fiber is surrounded by what we have the endomyce. So we have just actually the muscle fiber. It's nothing but a modified cell. As it is elongated it is named the given what we have that is muscle fiber. Now this is another picture, somewhat a skeletal diagram in a different angle. We have to go through that one. Now let's take each individual muscle cell is elongated as per the skeletal muscle. What's the nature of the muscle? And cylindrical in shape. Suppose this is what we have, the skeletal muscle fiber, the muscle cell, which is normally cylindrical in shape. Cylindrical in shape. Now it is normally in the form of syncytium that means having a multinucleate condition. It is multinucleate. That's why it's called a syncytium. The name is called syncytium. As in the case of, for example, sinusitic mycelium and fungus. Without cross walls, we have the cytoplasm is continuous with many nuclei. Here too, the cross wall is not absent. A single cell has many nuclei. Such a multinucleate condition with the continuity of protoplasm is called what is called a syncytium. So, Normally, the cytoplasm of the muscle is called what is known as sarcoplast, in which only we have many nuclei. So I mentioned that each cell is surrounded by membrane called sarcolemma equal to the plasma membrane. Sarco means flesh. So plasma lemma we are using the common word here it is given sarcolemma. And similarly, the cytoplasm of a muscle fiber is called sarcoplasm. I mentioned normally the cytoplasm of the muscle fiber is in the form of sensation. Because we have multi-nucleate condition. Then, so this is what we have the picture showing. Multi, so each muscle, so we have the striations, you see that one stripes are present. The outermost membrane is called sarcolemma and having the multi-nucleate condition. Then the cytoplasm is called sarcoplasm. Even the mitochondria is also called sarcosome. And the endoplasmic reticulum is called sarcoplasmic reticulum. It plays a major role in muscle contraction. How I'll tell you that now. So sarcoplasmic reticulum is nothing but endoplasmic reticulum. It is a main storehouse of calcium ions. The main storehouse of calcium ions. That is nothing but the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And it takes part in contraction process. Because only when calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the initiation of muscle contraction happens. So hence now, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is called, that is normally the storehouse of calcium and taking part. Now if you are taking the sarcoplasm, the sarcoplasm we have, thread-like structures are present 4 to 20, that is thread of form, they are running parallel to what is called the length of the muscle fiber. These filamentous structures found in the sarcoplasm number 4 to 20 are called myofibrils or myofilaments myofibrils or myofilaments. So that is each muscle cell contains 4 to 20 myofibrils. 
they are taking part in the muscle contraction. Now, the skeletal muscle fiber is striated the reason for that one. The myofibrils, each myofibrils exhibit dark and light bands. Dark and light bands. That give what is called striped appearance or striated appearance to the muscle fiber. I mentioned already the sarcoplasm reticulum which is found in the cytoplasm is a store of subcalcium neurons playing a major role in muscle contraction. Now, the cytoplasm of skeletal muscle fiber Skeletal muscle, some of the skeletal, not all the muscle fibers contain a kind of hemoglobin. A kind of what is called hemoglobin. It's not actually hemoglobin, it is different in structure from hemoglobin, it doesn't contain any an atom. So it is called muscle protein. With 153 amino acids called myoglobin, having more oxygen carrying capacity than normal hemoglobin, the one which is found in the RBC. So myoglobin is normally found in the red muscle fibers or aerobic muscle fibers. You will see the comparison. They have the ability of carrying oxygen but it is a protein. Hemoglobin is also a protein formed of EC that one two chains, alpha and beta chains. Okay. So here too it is a protein with 153 amino acids found only in the skeletal muscles, not in all the muscles. It is more concentrated in some muscles, particularly in the red muscles or we have aerobic muscles. You will see the difference later on with the oxygen carrying capacity. Remember this one. It is having more oxygen carrying capacity than a normal hemoglobin. Now, I mentioned about the muscles are striated. The striped appearance is due to the presence of two types of proteins. The proteins are named what is called actin and then myosin. These are the two types of proteins. I mentioned because suppose you are taking a muscle fiber, we have dark bands and then light bands. Suppose this is the dark band. I am taking a simple one. I will take a picture later now. So this is the dark band, this is the light band. Likewise, we have dark and light bands are formed alternately. So they give appearance striate. This is because of what's called the two types of proteins, actin and myosin. Actin is made up of not only actin alone, it is made up of two more types of proteins, tropomyosin and troponin actin, together form actin. Tropomyosin, troponin and actin together form actin protein. Now the myosin, so it is actually made up of, that is what we get the myosin protein, we will see what is the type of protein. Now we have in the just muscle fiber, we have a light and dark. The light band is otherwise called I band. I refers to isotrophic bands, isotropic. Because it is having the same physical property throughout its length. I band, isotropic meaning having similar physical property. More or less we can say homogeneous. The dark band is otherwise called A band. Otherwise called anisotropic bands. They contain myosin. So, the light bands mainly contains what is called actin. The dark bands contain that is what is called anisotropic and it's myosin. Not only myosin, a little bit actin also present here. So I band isotropic, anisotropic, what we have different physical properties in the same region. And these two regions, these two what we have the actin and myosin filaments, we can see the proteins are arranged parallel to the what is called parallel to the surface of the muscle fiber and also parallel to each other along the entire logical axis of the muscle fiber. So the dark and light bands give striated appearance hence the name what is called striated muscle. Now this is what is called we are taking out one myofibril. Now each myofibril consists of I mentioned about a light band. The light band is formed of you see the form only thin filament. And that thin filament is made up of what is called actin protein. That is why it is also called actin filaments or thin filaments. Now the A band. So this is what we have the I band. Now this is what we have the A band. This is A band. What is given A band. The A band is normally made up of actually thick filaments made up of myosin along with some part of thin filaments made up actin. So A band is made of both the thick and thin filaments, namely the thick filament is otherwise called myosin filaments. 
the thin filament is always called active filaments. Whereas the I band is formed of only thin filaments or active filaments. Now, in the center of A band, there is a light dense zone, what is called H zone. A light dense zone, what is called H zone. Now, this is a H zone. The H zone is without what is called thin filaments. If you are taking what is called the A band, it is formed of both the thick and thin filaments. And leaving a space in the center where you have only the thick filament, there is no thin filament. That is why that region is called H zone. Henzen zone. Henzen zone, after the name of the person. Now, the I band is bisected by a fibrous tubule. That fibrous tubule is called Z line. You see that one? A zigzag line. That is why it is called Z line. The I band or the light band is bisected by a fibrous tubule which is more or less in the form of zigzag hence the name is Z line hence the name is Z line then in the center of what is called H zone the thick filaments are also held together by means of membranous line membranous line a fibrous membranous line what is called M zone or the M line or M band so, M band or M line. Now, we will see furthermore the structural aspect. So, I mentioned about, you see that one, we have, we are taking, now this is one Z line. Bisecting what is called the I band. This is another Z line. You see that one? See, the I band is bisected by the Z line. A kind of what is called fibrous tube. And in the center of what is called A zone also, there is a membranous line, a fibrous membranous line. That is called the M zone. Now you could see here, there is a distance between the two successive Z lines. That distance between the two Z lines in the myofibril is called a sarcomere. Otherwise called as a unit of muscle contract. Sarcomere, otherwise called as a unit of muscle contract. So the distance between the two Z lines in the muscle fiber is called sarcomere and that is a unit of muscle contraction. Normally what is happening during the muscle contraction? Now the two Z lines are moving towards the center. So the shortening of the sarcomere occurs but there is no change in the length of either A or light. A or what sorry, actin or myosin. There is no change in the length of actin and myosin filaments. That means there is no change in the length of thick and thin filaments. But there is a change in the length of I band. But there is no change in the length of A band. So during muscle contraction, two Z lines are pulled towards each other. Because the thin filaments are attached to the Z line firmly. This is one. So that is why we have the shortening of the sarcomere. Second one. There is no change in the length of either thick or thin filaments. But about the length of I band and A band. So the length of the I band has been reduced. The length of the I band has been reduced. But there is no change in the length of what is called A band. And again what is happening? The filaments are moving towards each other. Why just Z lines are moving towards each other during contraction. The filaments are moving towards each other. So there is overlapping of what is called the thick and thin filaments. And the H zone disappears during muscle contraction because of the extension of the thin filaments. Under stable conditions, when there is no contraction, the thin filaments and the two edges of the thick filaments are lightly overlapping. Now, these are all the edges of the thin filaments. A part of the thin filament is overlapping the edges of the thick filaments. Okay, so that is what is happening to begin with. But during contraction or at the end of contraction, you can see the thin filaments are completely sliding over each other and also over the thick filaments, so that the H zone disappears. So the actin filaments are thinner in nature, hence called thin filaments, then what we get the myosin filaments, hence the name thick filaments. In the center of each I band, I mentioned is an elastic fiber called Z line which bisects it. The thin filaments are firmly attached to the Z line, what I mentioned the diagram. The thick filaments, the A band, are held together in the middle of this band by a thin membrane, a fibrous membrane, and that is what is called the M line.
Now, the A band and I bands are arranged alternate, giving a striated appearance. So, the length of the myofibrils, hence, we have what is called normally, that is a striated appearance. What is sarcomere? So, the portion of the myofibril between two successive Z line is called what is known as myosarcomere. So, we have normally the arrangement is like this Z line, then I band, then A band, then next I band, then next Z line. So, in between the two Z lines, we have I, A, I bands. That gives what is called the sarcomere. So, this sarcomere is considered as a unit of muscle contraction. The sarcomere is considered as a unit of muscle contraction. You can see here the diagram. A little bit just, actually, this is the M line. And that one is a diagrammatic one. This is somewhat. This is A band. You could see in this one, the A band is formed of both thick and thin filaments. Both thick and thin filaments. This is fact number one. Then the I band is formed of only thin filaments alone. You see that one, only thin filaments alone. You can see here, I band is made up of only thin filaments alone. Then the H zone, this H zone is formed of only thin filaments. Okay, I'll repeat once again. Now the I band is formed of only thin filaments. H zone is formed of only thick filaments. Whereas A band is formed of full of thick filaments and partly thin filaments. Now, structure of contractile proteins. You see that one I mentioned about normally, there are two filaments, thin and thick filaments. The thin filament is made up of protein actin, the thick filament is made up of protein myosin. We have to go a little bit uh, just uh, deeper to the molecular arrangement. Now, a structure of actin filament, a structure of actin filament or protein. So, all our proteins only considered as a muscle protein. Actin filament becomes actin protein. So, each actin protein is very thin. So it is made up of two F filaments or two F proteins. Two F actins or two. So it is formed of two F actins. Each actin is formed of two F actins. That means two filaments. And these two filaments are helically wound each other. See that one, the picture. Now this is the arrangement. You could see this one. Now, this yellow colored one indicating what is called this one F actin. That is what is called filamentous, 2 F actin. Each F actin is a polymer. This is what is called F actin. Each F actin is a polymer. Made up of, that is what is called globular protein units, what is called G actin monomer. Now, this is G actin monomer. G actin monomer. Now, this actin is made up of not only this is what is called actin F, two actin F, but also parallel to this one, along with this two, what is called F actin, we have two more filaments. These two more filaments are called tropomyosin. The green colored one is a tropomyosin. This is also actually on each other and parallel to what is called the F actin. So this is F actin, otherwise called F filamentous actin, filamentous actin. So, made up of just actually two polymer chains. Each one is formed of just the monomeric unit, what is called G actin mono, nothing but globular protein. And along with this one parallel to this, what is called actin, we have two, a part of what is called the actin filament only, two what is called tropomyosin filaments, they are running parallel to each other and also bound to each other. And at regular intervals in the actin filament, there is another protein, what is called troponin. This is the troponin, having three units. Now, this troponin normally hiding certain place, what is called masking that place. The place masked by this troponin is called what is known as myosin binding site. During muscle contraction, the myosin binds with what is called this region, which is being masked by the troponin. At the time of contraction only, now the troponin is lifted and showing or exposing what is called the binding site for the myosin. I will show the structure of myosin too. Now, this is the binding site. This is the binding site. It's normally that is uh, what is called concealed or masked by the troponin. So, an actin is formed of two chains of F filaments or F proteins and then two what is called tropomyosin. And then actually at regular intervals we have troponin at not 
arrange it regularly, you see that what at regular intervals, formed of three units, masking the site for the attachment of the myosin during muscle contraction only they are exposed. So during my contraction only the troponin being normally lifted, exposing the binding site for the myosin, then only the myosin is binding with that what is called the binding site with the help of what is called hydrolysis of ATP to release energy. Okay, that is about this one. And now we'll go for some other structures. Okay, I'll go for that. Now, structure of actin protein I mentioned about it is formed of actually two F proteins which are helically warm each other and it is a polymer and F actin is a polymer of monomeric G. There is nothing but globular actin, monomeric G actins. There is monomeric G actin is a monomeric unit. The two filaments of another protein namely tropomyosin what I mentioned also run close to the F actin, the two F actins throughout its entire length. Then a complex protein by name troponin made up of units, three units, is distributed at regular intervals on the tropomyosin. Now in the resting stage of the subunit of troponin, subunit formed of three units I mentioned, mass active binding sites for myosin on the active filaments. It masks the what is called the binding site. Only when the region is exposed, only when the troponin is moving away from the site, then only the binding of myosin, another protein. The thick filamentous protein, thick filament formed of myosin protein can bind, making the contraction of the muscles. We will see under the mechanism. Now, this is the one we have the myosin, we will see the structure in detail later on. So, that's about what we have the structural aspect of acting. Three components we have to remember. Now, structure of myosin protein this is otherwise called as a thick filament. Each myosin is also a polymer of protein. And the unit of this one is called viromyosin. And there it is called G monomeric unit, G monomeric G, globular. This one is called viromyosin, the unit, viromyosin. And each viromyosin has two important parts if you are taking the viromyosin. Now, a globular head and a short arm, called what we call, see that one. So now you see that one, this is a globular head, this is a globular head and a short arm, this is a short arm and actually this is called as a neck together from the short arm, it's called as heavy mirror myos and that is followed by a tail, a twisted tail like this, twisted tail and that is called light mirror myos. So the head plus the neck together from the short arm is formed of heavy viromyosin and then we have that is actually the tail spiral energy tail formed of light viromyosin LMM. Now the short arm and the head together from the cross arm. The short arm together head form otherwise called as cross arm. Now in the what is called the head now myosin is a source of enzyme what is called ATPase adenosine triphosphatase. This is called myosin ATPase. Now adenosine triphosphate phosphatase that is the enzyme responsible for the breakdown of ATP to release energy for the muscles to undergo contraction. So the one question came in the question paper myosin ATPase is found in the head of myosin. Simply it is called as simply what we call though I am using the word myosin, the person is like that. ATPase enzyme is located in the head of what is called that is uh, myosin, the viromyosin. Now this viromyosin also has another area. So the enzyme is present ATPase in the what is called the myosin head. So it's kind of the enzyme. ATPase enzyme is present simply we can say myosin. Meromyosin or myosin? And we can say there is meromyosin because the unit is called meromyosin. The head part. The head part also causes a binding site for the actin filament. Now this is the part binds with the actin filament where you see that one, the troponin is present. The troponin is being removed only at the time of contraction to which normally the actin binds with this meromyosin head. Another site what we got for the attachment of ATP. So it has two sites, one for 
actin binding site, another one ATP binding site. Once ATP is bound with this one, then only it is being normally broken with what is called thin filament. I will tell you that what is called the mechanism. So anyway, what is happening normally? So it is having what is called a head and then short arm together called as a cross arm. And then the head has an actin binding site. This side is the one which is binding with the actin filament during the time of contraction. And also it has a site for binding up ATP. Once ATP is binding with that one. Now the head and short arm together from the cross arm. It is being separated from what is called actually the thin filament. So when hydrolysis of ATP occurs to release energy, now this cross arm attaches to the actin filament. Once the contraction has been completed, once again what is happening, once the energy has been exhausted, now the ATP binds with the ATP binding site. So now the cross arm is being detached from, I will explain the mechanism, is being, being detached from what is called, that is uh, actin filament. So this is about the structure of the myosin, the myosin monomer. Now cross arm, what is cross arm? Now the HMM, the heavy myosin component, head and short arm, they project outwards at regular distance and angle from each other from the surface of the polymerase myosin filament called cross arm. The globular head has an active ATPase enzyme binding site and has binding site for ATP. So enzyme, conduct, enzyme is there in the head and also binding site for ATP. So ATPase enzyme is for the hydrolysis of ATP to release energy for muscle contraction. So in the head region we have three. One the enzyme ATPase, two ATP binding site. The third one what we have the active site for what is called the active for attachment. Now mechanism of muscle contraction. Before that one, you see that one I mentioned about the cross arm, this one in structure, you can see in the picture. Now this is what we call the cross arm. Otherwise called as a cross bridges. They are nothing but what we call the myosin head. They are projecting out in the form of what is called cross bridges or cross arm. So now these cross bridges only attaches to the thin filament and making thin filaments pull towards what we call the center and that is resulting in contraction of the muscle because of the shortening of the z line. Okay, now what is the mechanism? So the mechanism of muscle contraction was proposed by two people. The mechanism of muscle contraction and it is being explained by means of what is called sliding filament theory as proposed by Hugh Huxley and Hansen in 1965. Huxley and Hansen in 1965. Now, according to this concept, what is happening? Now, this theory states that the contraction of the muscle fiber takes place by the sliding of thin filaments over the thick filaments. The sliding of thin filaments over the thick filament, again, is called as what is called the sliding filament theory over the thick filaments. So, when the thin filaments are sliding over the thick filaments, what is happening? A shortening of the, short, uh, shortening of the sarcomere occurs, leading to that is a contraction because the successive sarcomeres are so shortening, leading to the total shortening of the muscle fiber, leading to the contraction of the muscle. As the thin filaments are sliding over the thick filaments, the process is called sliding filament concept or sliding filament theory. Now, how is it happening? Now, muscle con contraction is initiated by what is called a signal. The signal is sent by what is called the motor now. But, sorry, by the central nervous system through the motor now. Now, a segment of motor now and a muscle fiber together called as a motor unit. Suppose you are taking the face, we have a number of motor units. That's why we have to smile. There are 14 muscles that are involved in smiling. So, these 14 muscles have many motor units. They are innervated by a number of branches. That is why we can express easily. Any expression can be noticed in the face because of what is called many motor unit. What is a motor unit? One muscle fiber with what is called a motor nerve fiber. So a motor neuron along with the muscle fiber connected to it constitutes a motor unit. So the central nervous system gives up information carried by the motor nerve or the motor neuron reaching the surface of the muscle fiber and the junction between the muscle fiber and the neuron is called, or the nerve fiber is called motor, what is called neuromuscular junction. 
neuromuscular junction or we can say simply the motor end plate. The junction between a motor neuron and the sarcolemma, that is the surface of the muscle fiber, is called the neuromuscular junction or motor end plate. Now once a signal reaches the surface of the motor, the surface of what is called the neuro, sorry, surface of the sarcolemma, what is happening? Action potential is generated. That is what we can say the depolarization process leading to the formation of action potential resulting in the release of a neurotransmitter and the neuromuscular junction and that is called acetylcholine. Once the acetylcholine is released, it is a neurotransmitter now on the surface of the muscle fiber, on the surface of the sarcolemma, what we call the generation of the action potentials. Now you see that one, surface of muscle fiber, now the path of action potential, once and now fiber reaches the surface, what we have, that is the motor end plate or we can say neuromuscular junction, the junction between the nerve fiber or the neuron and the muscle. Now, as a result, the action potential is generated. Now, the action potential generated is entering into the muscle cytoplasm through what is called a vertical tubule, what is called T-tubule. And these two tubules are connected to what is called the endoplasmic reticulum or sarcoplasmic reticulum. Once the action potential reaches to the endoplasmic reticulum, the calcium ions are released. Once calcium ions are released, it initiates the actual process of muscle contraction. So, a now impulse reaching the surface of the muscle fiber, then generating action potential because of the release of acetylcholine. The acetylcholine generates action potential. The action potential is being transported through what is called the T-tubule to the endoplasmic reticulum and sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now the sarcoplasmic reticulum releases the calcium ions. That is the one responsible for changing the configuration of the troponin to expose what is called the binding site for meiosis. That is the main reason why calcium is responsible for muscle contraction. These are all the sequential events. So, reaching up now impulse to the surface of the muscle fiber, then re release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction, which generates action potential, which are being transmitted through what is called the two tubules to reach the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which in turn releases calcium ions. The calcium ions now initiate the process of muscle contraction. These are all the different events. Now, the action potentially spreads through the muscle fiber and causes the release of calcium ions into the sarcoplasm. Once calcium ions concentration increases in the cytoplasm and sarcoplasm, it leads to the binding of calcium in the subunit of troponin on active filaments and thereby remove the masking active sites for myopes. So, I mentioned about you see that one calcium ions are released, they bind with what is called the subunits of troponin, three subunits there. And as a result, configuration changes occur in the troponin so that it is being moved away from that, that is the binding site for meiosis. Now the binding site for meiosis is exposed. And utilizing the energy from ATP, hydrolyzed with the help of ATPase enzyme from the meiosis, that energy is used for actually, that is, to expose the active site on the active to form a cross bridge. Now, the cross arm binds with what we call the exposed binding site in the actin and as a result, a cross bridge is developed and that is called optimization complex. This is because of what is called hydrolysis of ATP. Energy is released, that is used for actually, that is uh, binding of, uh, binding of, that is meiosis with the actin. Now, this is somewhat a different structure, we have to go through what is happening all over, simple, just actually somewhat uh, a little different. Now this is acetylcholine vesicles, acetylcholine receptor and the puffinings are released. Now the calcium ions are released, released by all these things, some diagrammatic representation showing that one, what is happening, the ion channel opens, allowing the calcium ions, allowing what we call the acetylcholine to reach the sarcoplasm reticulum, allowing the calcium ions to be released into the cytoplasm and sarcoplasm, which causes configuration changes in the troponin so that now the binding site which is masked is exposed for the binding of the hate of myosin, the myromyosin. Now as a result what is happening, with the help of energy as it is hydrolyzed, 
Now this cross bridge, the one formed the octomyosin complex across bridge after binding with the troponin. That is after binding with the actin, not troponin, after binding with actin after the removal or the lifting or displacement of the troponin. This causes the pulling of the attached filaments towards the center of A band. This is called power stroke. Now the cross bridge formed with the actomyosin complex pulls the actin filaments towards the center. This is called what is known as a power stroke. Now once the actually it is pulling the thin filaments towards the center, the Z lines are also pulled towards the center because the thin filaments are attached to the Z line. As a result, now the contraction of the I band occurs. The length of the I band is reduced, whereas the length of the A band remains constant. The length of the sarcomere also decreases between the two Z lines. Now, this actin activates myosin ATPS, which results in the release of energy for the movement of myosin cross. So, the energy is provided by ATP. The hydrolysis of ATP is brought about by ATPase enzyme. Don't forget that enzyme is formed in the myosin head. That is responsible for the hydrolysis of ATP to release energy. That is responsible for the movement of the cross bridges, which in turn pulls the thin filaments towards the center. When the thin filaments are pulled, the thin filaments, as the thin filaments are attached to the Z line, the Z lines are also pulled. Likewise, all the Z lines are also pulled towards each other. Successive sarcomas are also being shortened, leading to the contraction of the muscles. So, this is happening as per the calcium ion is present in the sarcoplasm, not in the sarcoplasm reticulum. Once contraction is taking place, the calcium ions are present in the sarcoplasm. The myosin releasing the ADP and phosphate goes back to the relaxed state. So, once actually ADP and then that is phosphate goes back to it's a relaxed state. Now a new ATP binds with what is called the head. Once a new ATP binds with the ATP head, now the cross bridges being get detached. So attachment occurs when hydrolysis of ATP occurs. And detachment occurs when the ATP, a new ATP binds with what we have. <coughs> the binding site in the head region. Now the ATP is again hydrolyzed. Once again what is happening, the hydrolysis of ATP occurs by ATP is enzyme the myosin. As a result, now what is happening? The cycle of cross bridge formation and breakage is repeated. So it is being repeated formation and then what we call destruction of cross bridges. So formation and broken of the cross bridges occurs. So formation occurs when hydrolysis of ATP occurs and the detachment of the cross bridges occur while ATP binds with what we call cross bridge. So likewise the process is being repeated. As a result, what is happening? The cross bridges are returning to their original position. This is called recovery stroke. So like that, what is happening? The process is going on happening until otherwise the calcium ions are present in the sarcoplasm. Once the calcium ions are returning back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, then there is no more what is called contraction of the muscle occurs because once again the troponin mass, the binding site in the actin filament for myosin. So the binding site for myosin filament in the actin filament is done only by the calcium ions. That calcium ion is found in the sarcoplasm reticulum. That is being released only during contraction. So after the contraction gets over, once again the calcium ions are returning back to the sarcoplasm reticulum so that the process is being stopped. So we have just actually the power stroke, recovery stroke are taking place. That is uh, alternately, this causes the return of the Z lines back to their original position there is a relaxation once the calcium ions are returning back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum now what is happening relaxation occurs so the reaction time of the fibers can vary in different muscles it is not uniform the reaction time is not uniform for different muscles in the body it is different now the swimming movements the swing movements sorry the swing movements and the attachment and detachment of cross bridges now a sw swing movements occur that is a one brought about by the cross bridges that is responsible for pulling what we have, the thin filaments to a center. So attachment and detachment of the cross bridges occur and that is the main cause for pulling the thin filaments towards the center. And this process is called what is called ratchet mechanism or walk along mechanism. The cross bridges are walking along the muscle fiber. That is what along the myofibril filaments, not muscle fiber or my myofibril filaments, namely actin and then myosin. 
And that mechanism is called ratchet mechanism or walk along mechanism. Now this is what is happening. Now this is the myosin head. This is a cross bridge. So formation of cross bridge first. The cross bridge binds with what we have actually there is an actin filament. This is the myosin head cross bridge, the total one. Now it binds with the actin. When? When the ATP is hydrolyzed. By the hydrolysis of what is called ATP to form ADP and inorganic phosphate, what is happening? It binds with the binding site in the actin filament and then it is normally swing and so that it is being pulled towards the center. Now we see that we are breaking up cross bridge. So once the activity is over, one pulling, for the next pulling what is happening? The ATP, a new ATP comes and binds with the cross bridge. As a result, now this cross bridge is being broken. Its connection with the actin filament is being broken. When hydrolysis occurs, it binds with the actin. When we have just actually ATP is a new at ATP is attached to the head, the binding site. Now what is happening? The binding site with the actin filament is broken and now by the hydrolysis of ATP, once again what is happening? This attaches to the next position. So that it pulls the thin filaments by the by its swinging movement. That is called the ratchet mechanism. So these are all the different that is uh, processes happen. So sliding filament theory, what is happening? You see that one, this is relaxed state. You see that one slight overlapping of thin filaments over the thick filaments, not fully. So the laser lines are further apart. Now during contraction, so we have partial contraction. So during partial contraction, thin filaments are sliding over the thick filaments. When the contraction is fully completed, you see that one, the thin filaments are completely sliding over what is called the thick filaments. As a result, the hydrosome gradually decreased in its what is called length and finally disappeared. So this is fully relaxed state, partially contracted and fully contracted. This is another again the same one what is happening. You see that one, these are all the cross bridges. Now this is actually thin filaments being pulled towards the center. You see that one is being pulled towards now the head is zone is completely almost disappeared, almost disappeared and finally it completely disappeared. Now what are the major six steps in muscle contraction? What we have the major six steps are cross bridge cycling. Cross bridge cycling is nothing but you see that one, the cross bridges are doing the work. You are pulling the thin filaments towards the center. What are the steps? Now the influx of calcium ions. First, influx of calcium ions triggering the exposure of binding sites and act. So influx of calcium ions from the endoplasm region, they are influx to the sarcoplasm. The second one, the binding of myosin to act. Release of calcium ions, binding of myosin to act. Now the power stroke of the cross bridge that causes a sliding of acting, power stroke, pulling. And then recovery stroke means once again returning back to the original condition. The next one, the binding of ATP to the cross bridge, which results in the cross bridge disconnecting from act. So binding of ATP disconnects the actin and the release of energy by the breaking down of ATP attaches the cross bridge with the binding site in the actin. Now the hydrolysis of ATP which leads to the re-energizing and repositioning of the cross bridge. So that's why I said by the breaking down of ATP now the cross bridge is reorganizing, re-energizing and then just repositioning to the next place. Likewise they attach themselves one after another pulling the thin filaments. Now the transport of calcium is back into the sarcoplasm reticulum once the muscle action, the contraction has been complete. Then we have the relaxation. So whenever calcium ions are released, we have the muscle contraction occurs. Whenever the calcium ions are returning back to the sarcoplasm reticulum, no contraction occurs. Now the, I mentioned already what is the source of energy for muscle contraction. ATP is the immediate source of energy for muscle contraction. As ATP content is very low, it is actively replenished continuously by energy rich column. So, once ATP is broken, converted to ADP and inorganic phosphate, now as the amount of ATP available in muscle is very low, it should be what is called re energized. So, that is what is called actually re synthesis of ATP should be done. And that should be done with the help of what is called an energy rich compound. The one which is found in the muscle for the phosphorylation of ADP to form ATP is called phosphorylation. 
The energy rich compound present in the muscle for the phosphorylation of ADP to form ATP is formed. That is normally, that is what is known as phosphogen. The nature of the phosphogen is different in the case of vertebrate muscle and invertebrate muscle. In the case, so the nature of the phosphogen is normally different in vertebrate muscles and invertebrate muscles. In vertebrate muscle, it is called creatine phosphate, or simply called a CP. The same one, the phosphogen, helpful in the phosphorylation of ADP to form ATP, is arginine phosphate in invertebrates. So, creatine phosphate in the case of vertebrates and arginine phosphate in the case of invertebrates. So, it is called muscle phosphogen. What is a phosphogen? I mentioned already. A phosphogen is nothing but energy rich compound responsible for the phosphorylation of ADP to form ATP which help in what is called muscle contraction and uh, that is the anhydrous form of creatine phosphate is nothing but what is called creatinine you know that one one of the important excretive product that level should be made so it is normally you know that one creatinine is completely eliminated from the body through excretion creatinine that is what is called anhydrous form of creatine phosphate okay so we have three different types of substances, you know that one. Some substances are actively transported, some are passively. So threshold, A threshold substances, threshold substances, like that you know that one. We will talk about it once again. So creatine phosphate provides energy. Now we see that one ATP hydrolysis to form ADP, inorganic phosphate with the help of enzyme, ATP, ASC. That is what happens. Now the creatine phosphate phosphorylates ADP to form ATP. Now the create a phosphate. That is creatine phosphate is a phosphate. Now once CP gets exhausted, energy released during the oxidation of glucose is transferred to ADP and create. So how is it normally phosphorylated to the create? So during oxidation of glucose, what is happening? Energy is released. That energy is being utilized not only for the phosphorylation of ADP but also the phosphorylation of creatine. Hence, once again it becomes phosphorylated to form creatine phosphate. Now, ATP and CP are formed, that is adenosine triphosphate and then creatine phosphate are formed and which in turn supply energy for muscle contraction. This is happening. Once ATP law being exhausted, now the ADP is phosphorylated by CP already available in the muscle and once again the creating the one, the product formed after what is called phosphorylated ADP is being phosphorylated along with ADP by the energy available due to the oxidation of glucose in the muscles and the same one being utilized once again for the muscle contraction. So repeated activation of the muscles can lead to what is called accumulation of lactic acid when the muscles are doing work repeatedly. So that results in the accumulation of lactic acid. And due to anaerobic breakdown of glycogen in the causing muscle fatigue. So muscle fatigue is mainly caused because of the accumulation of what is called lactic acid due to repeated this what is called sternovous muscular contraction. Now to utilize the lactic acid to back them into glycogen and then hydrolyze them to form carbon dioxide and water, there is a cycle, a biochemical cycle what is called Cori and Cori cycle after the name of two persons. Now, lactic acid form in the muscle reaches the liver. So, it is formed in the muscle, then it is being transported to what is called liver through blood circulation. In the liver, nearly 80% of lactic acid gets converted into glycogen and stored in the liver. The remaining 20%, that is one fifth, is being oxidized to form carbonized water. So, lactic acid formed because of the sternovous muscular activity. Now, that is being transported to the liver where 80% of the liver, that is 4 fifth of actual lactic acid form, gets converted into glycogen. The remaining 1 fifth is being oxidized, that, that is nothing but 20% to form carbon dioxide and water, due to aerobic respiration and that is being eliminated. This cycle is called Cori and Cori cycle. Now in the body we have two different types of muscles, one white muscles, another one red muscles. What do you mean by white muscles and what do you mean by red muscles? Now the red skeletal, that is related to the skeletal muscle. The skeletal muscles are again differentiated into red skeletal muscle and white skeletal muscle. What do you mean the red skeletal muscle? Normally these red skeletal muscles are called slow twitch muscles because they are undergoing contraction very slowly, attaining fatigue very slowly. Another one what we get the white skeletal muscles. 
they are normally fast twitch muscles. They are working vigorously and they become fatty, tired, quickly. Now let's compare and contrast these two muscles. Red musculate muscle, white skeletal muscle. Other is called, you see that one slow twitch muscle and then fast twitch muscle. You see the eye muscle is an example for fast twitch muscle. The back muscle is an example for slow twitch muscle. Now here, now what do you mean by that one? The red skeletal muscle is not rich in myoglobin with more amount of mitochondria, abundant mitochondria. The white muscles are normally, white skeletal muscles, absence of myoglobin, no myoglobin, that's why they are white in color. Because of the myoglobin, only the muscles are red in color. And the number of mitochondria is also low. The number of mitochondria is also low. And second one, I mentioned already, under a slow sustained muscle contraction for a long period of time without getting fat, without getting tired. But in the case of that one, they are meant for fast and strenuous physical activity over a short duration. The duration is here, very long, short duration because they are undergoing strenuous activity, they are getting actually fatigued, they become tired. Now, the red skeletal muscles rich in myoglobin are called as aerobic muscles. I mentioned about the extensor muscle of the back. This uh, varied, what is called the pain for a long time, it is working slowly with a sustainable action because of what's called the myoglobin, the extensor muscle of the back. And there you see that one, it is called anaerobic muscles, and particularly for the eyeball muscles. When you are seeing object or they are seeing the film, and we are going on just actually watching the film, then finally, that's the eye muscles become tired, because they are working just very vigorously and fast. So eye muscle is an example for the white skeletal muscle, or the fast teaching muscle. The back muscle is an example for red skeletal muscle or what we have the slow twitching muscles. Now the visceral muscle. When compared to what we have just regarding the structure, the location and also that is nature of regulation, they are entirely different from what is called the skeletal muscles. They are otherwise called smooth muscles because of the absence of striations. Now the individual muscle fibers are normally spindle shaped with a centrally located nucleus. That one is multi-nuclear, this is inner nucleus. <coughs> now they do not exhibit any striations, hence called smooth muscle. And normally they are found in the form of what is called actually sheets, in the form of sheets, and connected by or bound by loose connective and close. They are found in the form of sheets. Actually they are found in, I made a mistake, they are found in the form of sheets they are enclosed by sheet of loose connective tissue. They are called visceral muscles because they are found abundant in the walls of alimentary canal, the blood vessels, urinary bladder, ureter cells. So they are found in sheets enclosed with the sheet of loose connective tissue. The muscle bundles are arranged in sheets, what I mentioned are layers, not in the form of what we have actually bundles as in the case of fascicles of skeletal muscle. Now it is called involved muscle because it is not under the control of the conscious control, because it's not under the conscious control of what we call the animal or the brain, we can see. Unlike the striped muscle, the smooth muscles contract slowly and fat is slowly. That's why we are doing the physical activity of digestion, etc. very slowly and also without attaining fat. So contraction occurs very slowly and fat occurs very slowly. So they can remain in a state of partial contraction for a long time. That contraction is helpful even in the case of peristalsis. We can have the smooth contraction. The contraction of the smooth muscles of the esophagus. Also one of the actually smooth muscles helping what is called the swallowing of the food. Contraction occurs also partially for some time. Sphincters. Now the sphincters are a kind of smooth muscles that occur at the openings. For example, the anal openings are at the junction of the esophagus and stomach or at the junction of the stomach and duodenum, etc. So these are all the smooth muscles that occur around openings I mentioned about. That is anus around the openings between the esophagus, what is called the cornex sphincters, and then stomach and duodenum, what are called that is pyloric sphincters. So the main function is the regulation of passage of substances from one organ to the another. So for example, pyloric sphincter allows the passage of food from the stomach to the duodenum and also the cordex sphincter 
just allows a passage of food from what is called esophagus towards the stomach. So anyway, these are all the special type of what is called smooth muscles. Now this is the diagram showing the smooth muscles. You can see now the muscles are spindle shaped, having a well defined nucleus. But normally in these muscle fibers, the sarcolemma is absent. There is no sarcolemma in the case of such muscles. Now cardiac muscle tissue. The name itself implies that one, it is found only in the case of heart. That's why it's called cardiac muscle. Now, these muscles are having feeble striations and also involved in nature. Again, the muscle fibers are highly cramped. Okay, occurring only in the heart. Now, each fiber is a chain of cells joined end to end. A number of cells are joined together end to end. They exhibit the same pattern of alternating door and light bands as in the case of what is called skeletal muscles. So, in addition to the case of these muscles, we have a distinct, that is, transverse bands. They are not regular, transverse bands are present. These irregular intercalated discs are present only in the case of heart muscle. So, we have irregular transverse bands, they are called intercalated discs found only in the case of cardiac muscles. Again, the muscles are large. So the muscle cells are normally cylindrical, then short, and the ends are truncated. The meaning for truncation is bifurcate, branch. Now, in the case of smooth muscle, the sarcolemma is absent. Here, the sarcolemma is present, but not distinct. Then a large nucleus in the center of the muscle fiber, it is not in the form of sensation. The striations are feeble, what I told you. Now, the muscle fibers and lateral branches, which join similar branches of neighboring cells. That's why normally once the impulse is generated by the pacemaker of the heart is spreading very quickly to all parts of the muscle. This is because of the branching nature of the muscle. The narrow spaces between the adjacent cells are filled with the loose connective tissue. We have the branches and between the branches and the muscle cell we have spaces, narrow spaces. They are filled with the loose connective tissue. Now, cell junctions fuse the plasma membranes of the cardiac muscles. You see that one, cell junctions, the tight junctions, you know that one, desmosomes like that one. The cell junctions are nothing, the structures are joining the two, what is called the muscle fibers, through which only the exchange of material is possible. So, cell junctions fuse the plasma membrane of the cardiac muscles to join with one another. Now, there is no solution in the case of cardiac muscle fibers. Once formed, they cannot go for what is called mitosis. They are incapable of undergoing mitosis and do not process, actually, do not, I mean, they do not possess the property of what is called regeneration. Once damaged, they cannot be regenerated. So, no mitosis, no regeneration. And absence of some cells, what is called the pericytes and satellite cells, which stimulate mitosis, are being absent. Pericytes and satellite cells, they are responsible for stimulating the cells for mitosis. So the cardiac muscles never attaining fatigue, then there is no mitosis and there is no regeneration of the muscle once they are being lost. Now you see that one, the branches, now these are all the intercalated discs, the transverse bands, deep transverse bands, irregular nature called intercalated discs, they are found only in the case of muscle fibers. You see that one, the branches, the branches are joining with the adjoining branches from the adjoining muscle cells. Now one second is the cardiac muscle. You see that one, cross striations, the nucleus, the myocytes, the cells are called myocytes and then we have the intercalated disc, irregular disc. The muscles are branch and they are connected with one another. Now let's compare, welcome to this one, let's compare. The striped muscle fiber, smooth muscle fiber and also cardiac. Now, location attached to the bones occurs in the wall of the visceral organs and that will occur in the wall of the heart. Now, it's made up of single cells, long and cylindrical. Again, single cells, long and spindle shape. But here, a chain of cells joined with one another, short in nature, normally cylindrical, just like what we have the striped muscles, but they're highly branched, truncated ends and branched ends. Now, the cells are multinucleate. In both the cases of smooth muscles and cardiac muscles, they are uninucleate. Actin and myosin are regularly arranged, but in the case, that is both in the case of heart muscle and the striped muscle, the actin and myosin are regularly arranged. But in the case of smooth muscles, they are irregularly arranged. Now, contract quickly and fatigue quickly, 
And in the case of that one, smooth muscle contract slowly and fatigue slowly. And in the case of cardiac muscles contract and relax rhythmically without fatigue during lifespan. So it is innervated by the nervous system, the smooth muscles and the cardiac muscles are innervated by, you know, that one, the sympathetic or we can say autonomic nervous system. And fibers and branches in the case of smooth muscles and the skeletal muscles, but the fibers are branch in the case of cardiac muscles. And finally, that is tight muscles are voluntary, both cardiac muscles and smooth muscles are involuntary. And go through what we have the comparison, you can get the idea and about the voluntary. That is organization. Okay, so that's all about what we have the muscular system. Let's go for the skeletal system in the next class. Okay, thank you.